Hello and welcome to a very special Murder Murder News podcast episode live from the Pacific Northwest True Crime Fest in Auburn, Washington. <laughs> to all of you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. We're so thrilled to have met so many of you already and we look forward to making new friends all weekend long. In case you've never heard of MMN and are just discovering us for the first time today, we want to start off by introducing ourselves. This is Aurora, who I lovingly refer to as the real housewife of true crime. And my co-host is Angelina, who I like to describe as your new favorite crime-solving pixie. We call our listeners Monsters, which is a bit of a play on words using the acronym MMN. And we like to say that our weekly podcast episodes also serve as weekly meetings for our very own true crime cult, which we call the Monster Commune. But not to worry, you've landed in the cult with all of the flower crowns and none of the flavor aid. We have all of the baby goats and none of the brainwashing. Yeah, goats. <laughs> and we're not about any of those diet control or sleep deprivation tactics that some cults employ. The Monster Commune is the only cult with unlimited naps and snacks. <laughs> we kid around, but that's not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, which is a regular theme in true crime podcast episodes. And we're well aware that cults can be terrifying criminal organizations. But having seen so many cult documentaries, we were struck by how cool it all sounds before the inevitable creepy twist. We started daydreaming about a safe space to hang out with all of our spooky friends where the only twists are our Wednesday Adams braids. We like to imagine sitting around a crackling campfire sharing stories about the subject that unites us, murder. Now, without further ado, let's dig into this week's story. So eight years ago this week, 32-year-old Misty Upham disappeared from right here in Auburn, Washington under very suspicious circumstances. The vibrant young actress's career was really taking off as she had just appeared in August Osage County, which many of you have probably seen, uh, with Meryl Streep, Julia Roberts, and Juliet Lewis. And not long before, she was cast in Tarantino's Django Unchained, and Tarantino liked working with Misty so much, he wrote a role just for her in his upcoming film, The Hateful Eight. Since childhood, she dreamed of being the best living native actress. With all of her hard work, she was sweeping awards and attending Golden Globe, so it seemed like it was going to be a reality for her. That all came crashing to an end when she left her home on October 5th, 2014, never to be seen alive again. When Misty was ultimately found 11 days later, her death was ruled accidental, but there's a lot more to this story and her family and friends still believe her case did not get the attention it deserved. We want to give a quick shout out to our sources. I know that's so important in podcasting. Uh, and that included a great interview with her dad, who's a real powerhouse, Charles Upham, uh, who was on the Opperman Report podcast. Also a wonderful article, very in-depth on The Guardian. Uh, we Are Resilient, an MMIW true crime podcast, Wounded, a native true crime podcast, and many more sources, which we'll include in our podcast notes, uh, should anybody want to read more about this. Misty was born in Kalispell, Montana on July 6, 1982, to her parents Charles and Mona, and was a member of the Blackfeet Nation. Her Blackfeet name was Sweet Grass Woman. She was the youngest of three children with an older brother, Christopher, and older sister, Amanda. As kids, both Charles and Mona had been sent to boarding schools, more commonly known now as residential schools, which were set up as early as the 17th century with the intent of stripping culture from Native American students and assimilating them into Eurocentric life on the land these colonizers had literally just stolen from them. Students injured abuse and racism, were underfed, were made to cut their hair, were forbidden from speaking their native languages, and were Christianized. Many died from illness and poor nutrition, and there was rampant sexual, physical, and emotional abuse. Charles, her dad, felt it was important for him to move his family off the reservation so they would have more opportunities. In an interview with The Guardian, he said, quote, I was determined to take my kids away from the reservation where so many young people fail out to a place where they could get an education, have a grounding experience. I told the kids that they were going to learn that there is a stigma associated with being an American Indian, that people were racist and we lived under the stigma of alcoholism and being uneducated. When Misty was four, the Uphams moved to Billings, Montana for Charles to pursue his education. While attending school, he worked at Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and Kmart providing for his family. He got his bachelor's in music education and taught music in public schools for the next 16 years. Mona was a stay-at-home mom for the kids and also owned her own business. 
Misty had a hard time fitting into their new life in Billings, and when one of her friend's moms found out she was native, Misty couldn't go to their home anymore because her friend's mom believed they had bugs. She also later confided to a friend that she was sexually abused as a child by someone close to their family. Her family bounced back and forth between city life and reservation life in Browning, Montana, but things weren't really any easier for Misty at the reservation. Her family had been doing well financially with her dad teaching, and they had nicer things than some of the other families. At one point, Misty was invited to watch a horse be broken in with some supposed friends, but then the kids beat her up. When she was 12, a group of boys threw a jacket over her head, pulled her into a house, and raped her. After they left her, she recalled pulling her pants back on and setting out to walk home. Along the walk, she spotted a police officer and went to tell him what happened. He asked her where she lived and then told her she needed to sober up and go home. He told that to a 12-year-old rape victim. This wasn't the first time the system let Misty down, and it certainly would not be the last. Years later, on her blog titled, The Struggles and Triumphs of a Blackfeet Native with a Dream, she wrote, quote, There's a physical pain in never being able to forget it. The fear of having someone hold you down, the cheering and the laughter. All those noises won't leave my mind. I keep hearing it like a ghostly voice, but the physical is nothing compared to the mental. Misty experienced PTSD from her sexual and physical trauma and was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder as well. Of course, there's a connection between our mental health and our physical health, and the stress started to impact her physical health as well. She started getting sick frequently, started vomiting, and lost her appetite. Her parents took her to Indian Health Services for her symptoms, but they weren't really equipped to deal with the after effects of trauma for her sexual assault. They did diagnose her with H. pylori bacterium, which is common in places without clean water. The bacteria caused ulcers and vomiting, which in turn damaged her esophagus and the enamel to her teeth. She had to get dentures as a result, which, of course, she got teased about uh, with other kids, which is terrible. Mm -hmm. The illness took over her life, and she didn't want to hang out with friends or go to school. Her parents homeschooled her, and she became very depressed. But even with all of the mental health struggles and setbacks Misty had survived, there was one very bright light in her life, and that was acting. Charles remembers Misty first talking about acting when she was seven or eight. He's mentioned lots of kids say they want to be an astronaut growing up, but then grow out of it later. But not Misty. She really narrowed in on acting and wasn't going to let anything stop her. In an interview with BiggerGround.org, Misty was asked where her career was headed. She replied, quote, I have always known that I had a big purpose. Not to be cocky, but always knew. Just felt that driving power which made me fearless and relentless. My parents were told by more than one spiritual leader that I had a bright light around me. My uncle saw me before I was born and noted this light. My parents told me from birth my life would be hard, but it was to make me strong. A bigger purpose is what gave me the strength to keep living, end quote. At the age of just 12, she convinced her dad to take her to an acting workshop in Seattle. She said of the move, I needed to lose the reservation. I needed to leave. My idea was to go to the nearest city and go to the first theater I could find. I would watch movies, take breaks, and eat. At 13, I stopped being suicidal, and I found something to live for. It was in the workshop that she announced to the class at the age of 12, my name is Misty Upham, and someday you will know that name as the best living Native American actress. So sweet. <laughs> <laughs> While her family lived in Seattle, Misty attended classes at the Red Eagle Soaring Theater Group, a nonprofit started in 1991 specifically for Native youth. She attended classes, wrote skits, screenplays, acted, and directed for the next four or five years. Like, so talented at such a young age. Mm -hmm. The director of Red Eagle Soaring, Fern Renville, said Misty, quote, exemplified Indian persistence. She was tough as nails. She never expressed self-pity. She would express pain or angst, but not self-pity. And as an aside, um, you are allowed to have self-pity for yourself if you're struggling with your mental and physical health. I think yes. sometimes we hear this and it's like, I have to push through too, but you don't. No. Uh, and it's not always easy. And sometimes you just have to put on a brave face, which I think is what she was doing. Um, so we wanted to paint a picture of who she was as a person, though. At some point, Misty was filmed for an audition while in Seattle, and that video made its way into the hands of a casting director in Burbank, California. Charles recalls the day he received a phone call from casting asking Misty to audition for a movie. He thought it was a friend playing a prank on them, and he hung up the phone. 
The woman called back and said, this was the real deal. They wanted Misty to audition. Her first big break came in the 2002 film Skins, which was released when she was 20. She had a speaking role as Mrs. Blue Cloud, a woman who was abused by her husband. She had roles in a show called Skinwalkers, a TV movie, Edge of America, and a feature film, Frozen River. In 2012, she was cast as the character Minnie in Django Unchained. Unfortunately, her part was cut due to a filming issue with another actor, but she became friends with Quentin Tarantino, and he felt so bad about having to cut her part that he revived her character in his 2015 film, The Hateful Eight. He wrote the role just for her, but unfortunately, because of her disappearance, her part was recast by Dana Gorier. He kept the role in the movie in honor of Misty. In 2013, Misty appeared in August Osage County as Joanna Monavada alongside Meryl Streep, Julia Roberts, and Juliette Lewis. It had been her dream to act alongside Meryl, and Meryl later recorded a tribute to Misty, saying she was, quote, so lucky to be able to work with her and her unique blend of authenticity, passion, and compassion. Misty became close friends with Juliette Lewis, uh, which is probably pretty enviable to any of us watching Yellow Jackets. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she talked publicly about Misty many times. Uh, she said of their friendship, quote, Misty exemplified the true power, resilience, and artistry of the human spirit. She lived through unspeakable violence, yet she was aware of her own power, her own belief system. She did not fear death. She'd grown up knowing its hungry eyes well and spoke freely of this. One of our last conversations was about this very topic. She had defiance that she would work for and that would work for and against her. Anyone who knew her knew her history, her fractured emotional psyche, her past trauma. She would readily tell you. She knew voicing things that were meant to break you was the only way to conquer the pain and the past of it. Own your history. She also didn't mind making people uncomfortable, which I adore. And by hell or heaven, she'd earned that right. It was her badge and might the things she'd lived through, because she understood pain and suffering could read and heal it in others. She did energy work. She prayed for you, laid hands on you, cast out your own spiritual friction. She laughed too when you thought, sorry, <laughs> she laughed too when you thought you had troubles. She understood them, but knew you could get through them the way she had. Even if at times haunted, her artistry was the gift she left us all. She was nominated for and won several awards during her time as an actress, including a 2009 nomination for an Independent Spirit Award for Best Supporting Actress in Frozen River. She won an American Indian Movie Award for Frozen River and also an EDA Female Focus Award for the same film. She was nominated and won with the ensemble cast for August Osage County and for quite a few other awards as well. As her career took off, Misty refused to take what she referred to as res roles. She wanted to fight against the stereotyping of Native actors as drunks and focusing on the, native, er, on the negative aspects of reservation life. In an interview with FiggerGround.org, she said, it's like Hollywood and the rest of the world can't get their heads around the fact that Natives are modern. But you can't sell a vegan, agnostic Native American. People just aren't ready for that for some reason. That's what I want to change. Misty was a rising star, and she believed it was important to use that celebrity to become a voice for the voiceless. She was a member of PETA, Alliance for Domestic Workers, Caring Across Generations, and the Women of the World Foundation. Before her disappearance, she was working on establishing a theater group called Indigo Children Troop with the intent on bringing more arts programs to Native children on reservations. As true crime fans, you're likely already aware of the epidemic of violence against Indigenous women in the United States, Canada, and Latin America. But raising awareness of the ongoing crisis is incredibly difficult when we're so lacking in reliable data to track their cases and no reliable single source to look to for information. Government data is often inaccurate or incomplete, and as a result, government data collection has been heavily criticized in recent years, particularly as organizations focus on advocacy for indigenous communities have been cropping up and shining a light on data discrepancies. According to nativewomenswilderness.org, 5,712 cases of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls have been reported by the National Crime Information Center, but the U.S. Department of Justice Missing Persons Database has only reported 116 of those cases. That's only 2% of the cases. The organization cites lack of communication combined with jurisdictional issues between state, local, federal, and tribal law enforcement as major barriers to the investigative process. 
We're going to take a look at some shocking statistics that show the disproportionate rates of violence against the indigenous community and how important it is to raise awareness and urge investigative and government agencies to take a closer look at these reports and not be so dismissive to those seeking justice for their indigenous loved ones. Indigenous women and girls are murdered at a rate that is 10 times higher than that of all other ethnicities. Indigenous women are 1.7 times more likely than Anglo-American women to experience violence. The Centers for Disease Control lists murder as the third leading cause of death for indigenous women. The majority of these murders are committed by non-native people on native owned land. The murder rate of indigenous women is three times higher than that of Anglo-American women. 84.3% of indigenous women, which is more than four out of five, have experienced violence. More than half of all indigenous women experience sexual violence. Indigenous women are two times more likely to be sexually assaulted than white women. 55.5% of indigenous women have experienced intimate partner violence, and 48.8% of indigenous women have reported being stalked in their lifetime. The organization notes that accurate data collection is extremely difficult due to poor record keeping, underreporting, racial misclassification, and media coverage. As a result, the statistics we just quoted you are most likely an undercount. And I love this quote from nativewomenswilderness.org, which says, while condensing indigenous women's experience into a numerical value is a heavy burden that potentially relegates human women, girls, and two-spirit into statistics, the current numbers illustrate the harrowing conditions for indigenous persons within the U.S. Aside from the issues with law enforcement and data collection agencies, indigenous people also struggle to secure effective health care healthcare and medical services. The Indian Health Services was created in 1955, and the system consists of 26 hospitals, 56 health centers, and 32 health stations throughout the country that provide health care to indigenous people like MISTI. According to a study by New York Times, the Indian Health Services provides government medical care to 2.2 million of the nation's 3.7 million American Indians and Alaska Natives and is widely judged to provide substandard care. The New York Times inquiry pinpointed some specific issues plaguing the system that helped illustrate the inevitable struggles that Misty faced. An analysis of government data found that a quarter of medical positions within the Indian Health Service, including doctors, dentists, and nurses, are vacant. In some areas, the vacancy rate is as high as 50%. In states with IHS hospitals, the death rates for preventable diseases like alcohol-related illnesses, diabetes, and liver disease are three to five times higher for Native Americans than for other races combined. Federal government spending on health care for Native Americans lags behind that of almost any other population. <clears throat> the federal government spent $8,602 per capita on health care for federal inmates in 2016, compared with $2,843 per patient within the IHS. According to a report by the National Congress of American Indians, the Indian Health Service spent just $3,332 per patient in 2017, whereas Medicare spent $12,829 per patient and Medicaid spent $7,789 per patient that same year. The Government Accountability Office, a federal watchdog agency, put the Indian Health Service on its high-risk list of programs and operations in 2017. The agency says that some improvements have been made to the health service since then, but it does remain on the high risk list to this day. According to the Urban Indian Health Institute, 70% of American Indians live in urban areas, but only 1% of the Indian Health Service budget addresses urban programs. Because of this massive funding discrepancy, people in serious need are turned away every day. The systematic weaknesses in the health system forced officials to take matters into their own hands pretty soon after the arrival of the coronavirus pandemic, spending millions of dollars of tribal money to bolster the response. This is an ongoing problem that greatly impacts those statistics we discussed earlier about the mortality rate of indigenous women across the United States. Misty Upham was heavily reliant on the Indian Health Services and may not have realized that she could supplement her health care with additional resources under the Affordable Care Act. When she moved to California, I'm sorry, from California to Washington to care for her father, who was recovering from a series of strokes, Misty had to go through a process to reapply for her prescriptions to control her diagnosed depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and PTSD. After months spent living with her family in Washington and her sister's apartment from across from the Muckleshoot Casino, her prescriptions were running out one by one. 
Misty couldn't get a psychiatric appointment on the books until several months out and wasn't able to renew most of her essential, sorry, essential prescriptions like Prozac, Ambien, Ativan, Xanax, Venlafaxine, and Zoloft until late November. That would have been more than five months after her move to Washington and turned out to be over a month after her death. Kristen Mayares Young wrote in an article for The Guardian that when she was unable to secure the mental health support she so desperately needed, she turned to alcohol to try to dull the constant anxiety and panic that she suffered. She was not an alcoholic, her dad Charles Upham clarified. She substituted alcohol for her meds. She was self-medicating with her seemingly always just out of reach. Uh, Misty at times also abused benzodiazepines and self-harmed. In 2013... Misty was invited to the Golden Globe Awards to celebrate two nominations for the team she worked with on the film August Osage County, one each for Misty's co-stars, Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts. Rising star Misty Upham beamed in a gorgeous green gown, as you can see up there. She looks beautiful. This momentous occasion, however, turned sour when an unnamed Weinstein Company exec pulled her forcefully into the men's restroom. He ripped her beautiful dress and sexually assaulted her as a group of men watched. Charles Upham says that the men, quote, cheered him on like he was chugging a beer in a contest. After the event, Misty's parents pleaded with her to press charges, pointing out that she still possessed the ripped green dress with DNA evidence all over it. But Misty knew Weinstein would protect his own and feared that he would make every effort to end her career and ruin her life if she did file a report. Quote, how could anyone expect a sincere investigation when the Weinstein's company commander-in-chief is also a perpetrator, Misty asked her father. Every time a rape victim comes forward to get justice, they become the cause of the matter, she ranted. To underline just how cruel yet untouchable Harvey Weinstein seemed to be, Misty shared a story from a limousine ride she shared with Weinstein, Quentin Tarantino, and an assistant. When the assistant interrupted a conversation between Tarantino and Weinstein with an urgent business matter, Weinstein kicked him out of the car onto the side of the road in the middle of nowhere with no jacket and frigid weather. What if he freezes to death, Misty pleaded. Somebody will come along and pick him up, Weinstein snidely remarked. Misty's assault has received very little attention, even as the Me Too movement caused a stir across the industry. In 2017, Elliot Page launched into a diatribe on his Facebook page about the sexual harassment and sexual, um, I'm sorry, about the sexual harassment and assault that has long run rampant in show business, pointing to Misty's harrowing experience as an example. Responses to his uproar largely overlooked what Misty had gone through. In early 2014, Misty announced that she was pregnant and planned to name her baby Leaf. Friends say she quit drinking, determined to start fresh, and provide nothing but love and support for her little one. By May, sorry, (laughs) by May, Misty revealed to her Facebook followers that she had miscarried. This was the very same month that Misty's dad, Charles, suffered a series of strokes. Misty set her pain aside and relocated to Washington to care for her ailing father. As she settled in at home with her family, she fell under the care of a new set of doctors with whom Charles pleaded, please take care of her. She needs your help more than ever. In the year prior to her disappearance, the Auburn Police Department responded to five other incidents involving Misty Upham. As Police Commander Mike Herman put it in a news release, during those four incidents, Misty, quote, did not object to being transported by private ambulance for further evaluation. The Upham family and the news media framed those situations quite differently, saying that Misty was involuntarily committed. She was committed twice on July 21st, 2013, once in the morning, and then again in the evening. She was also submitted for mental evaluation on July 30th, August 15th, and August 21st of 2014. Misty's interactions with the Austin, or sorry, the Auburn Police Department on August 15, 2014, are most notable as eyewitnesses, reports and communication with the family and responding officers were referenced in a 2015 article in The Guardian. Charles Upham initially telephoned the police to report that his daughter was hysterical, swinging scissors and throwing things around the family's small apartment. Shortly thereafter, police received another call from an employee at the Muckleshoot Market in Delhi across the street. The employee reported that a shoeless woman was, quote, yelling, rambling, and prowling cars. 
Responding officers claimed that Missy was hiding in the bushes and lunged at them when they ducked into a shrub to chat with her. There are conflicting accounts of what happened next. Officers claimed they handcuffed Misty and put her in the back of a patrol car as she writhed around spitting and yelling threats that she would have them all fired from the police department. She was unruly, making a spectacle of herself, and the officers were just following regular procedures. Misty's parents watched the scene unfold from across the street. Mona wanted to interfere as she saw the mistreatment that her daughter was subjected to, but Charles knew it would only rile them up more, and it might be more effective to report the officer's misconduct after the fact rather than risk being arrested along with their daughter. They were tapping on the glass and making faces at her, Charles described. She was crying and telling them to stop and that they couldn't treat her like this. An officer said, well, if you're a movie star, why don't you call up George Clooney? When he brought Misty's purse to the patrol car so that she had her medication with her, an officer asked Charles if his daughter was delusional. Rolling his eyes and scoffing, she thinks she's a movie star. Well, she is, Charles confirmed. When her family later visited Misty in the hospital's emergency room, she had a black eye, a swollen jaw, and was covered in scratches and bruises. They were completely stunned as when they saw Misty off in the back of a police car, she did not have those injuries. Officers suggested the injuries were sustained when Misty jumped out of a second-story window. Misty said she didn't remember what happened, and I feel like she would have remembered that. When the Uphams accused the Auburn PD of mockery and brutality, they denied it. But we witnessed it, Charles explained. A press release from the Auburn PD claimed that officers responded to the Uphams' calls professionally and with compassion. A written report submitted for administrative review reads, quote, Based upon the totality of the circumstances, it appeared to me Misty's severe level of intoxication had caused her to fabricate her profession as a Hollywood actress with a Hollywood agent. I sarcastically questioned Upham about her profession and asked if she had ever met Hollywood actor Robin Williams. At one point, I interrupted her threats by making an abrupt, spontaneous babble noise in an attempt to distract her from her rants and to get her to quit yelling. This reads like an admission of guilt to mockery and misconduct. (laughs) It's unclear why the officer would have believed that making an abrupt and spontaneous babble noise while Misty was speaking would have calmed her down. Commander Mike Herman told The Guardian that the incident was embarrassing for the department because we strive for professionalism. Herman claimed the officer in question was counseled and coached and that his poor behavior was noted in his file. However, Herman claims that Misty's injuries came about as a result of her own intoxication. He assured the Guardian that there was no police, no police brutality whatsoever, noting that when an officer uses force on any subject, they are required to do a force report, and there were no force reports. On August 21st, police say that Misty Upham was apprehended after reports that she had tried to throw herself from the window of her family's second-story apartment. In the ER, she was calm and cooperative. She asked for medication for her anxiety, which it seems she never received, but according to a report, she was given a safety plan. On October 5th, 2014, Misty was at her sister's apartment in the Muckleshoot Reservation here in Auburn, where she had been staying with her family. That afternoon, Misty had another break, and when her dad was unable to help her, it was clear she would need medical attention. He called 911 for a medical transport. It were that they would only send help if Misty was a danger to herself or others. Charles said she was suicidal, even though she was not, and said she was not in a place where she could make rational decisions. Misty overheard him say this, and she was agitated by it. He, she went to find her mom and sat on the ground making strange noises. She started saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. She got up and said, I'm leaving. You don't have to worry about me anymore. She left home, but not with the intention of leaving for good. Around 1.30 p.m., she left the apartment with her purse, phone, wearing a tank top, sweater, sweatpants, and tennis shoes. She didn't take her hat, sunglasses, or the jacket she normally wore with her, nor any other items she would have grabbed if she was planning on actually staying away. Mona, her mom, told Charles to go after her. Charles left, and when he left the door, he heard a, hey, and it was a police officer. Charles told the officer he was going to go get his daughter, and the officer told him to come right over right now. The officer insisted on searching the apartment for Misty, acting as though her parents were hiding her, acting as though Misty deserved to be arrested rather than get help for the mental health she clearly needed at that moment. The officer searched the apartment while Charles looked out the window, hoping to spot Misty. 
they asked what he was doing, and he said he was looking for his daughter and that he needed their help. They told him that she was an adult, and it wasn't illegal for an adult to just walk away. An adult which, 15 minutes earlier, the officers deemed so dangerous that they had to search the apartment to find and arrest her. But now it was apparently fine for her to walk away. Charles asked to file a missing person report, and the officers told him they couldn't file a report until she had been missing for 24 hours. As a true crime community, we know how crucial those first 24 hours are, and in Misty's case, finding her right away would have been life-saving. Aside from that, this actually was not the policy of the police department, and they hadn't been honest with Charles. The Auburn police have since stated that they didn't consider Misty as missing, rather suicidal, but we can't help but wonder why it would be less important to find someone who is in a mental health crisis. There was such a lack of empathy by the police department. After waiting out the 24 hours recommended by responding officers, Charles Upham reached out to the police to file an official missing persons report on October 6. However, police refused to elevate her status to endangered, which would issue a higher alert. On October 7, the detective was assigned to investigate Misty's case, but despite repeated requests from her family, an official police search party was never assembled. Charles recalls being shut down by officers who suggested she was just out partying and said that they had no evidence that she was even missing. On October 10th, reports, reporters hounded the department asking for an official press release because she actually is famous and she's an actress, so <laughs> Hollywood is starting to buzz at this point. And there was virtually no news of her disappearance or the progress of her case at this time. Commander Steve Stalker told reporters he had no intention to produce any such press release. On October 13th, the detective assigned to Misty's case, Lauren Orvis, wrote to a fellow officer inquiring about the outcome of any searches conducted thus far. Outcome? Officer Stephanie Bennett responded, nothing has been done yet. Later on October 13th, the press release was finally issued asking for helps from the pub. I'm sorry, tips, <laughs> helps from the public. <laughs> Tips from the public, this was eight days after Misty's disappearance. The Guardian revealed that the Auburn PD seemed more focused on saving face in the media than working together to close the case. Rather than, I'm sorry, rather than using social media to spread the word about Misty's disappearance, they flooded Facebook with cute puppy pics of canine officers, which also, P.S., maybe those canine officers could have been used to search for Misty. Right. <laughs> Ultimately, the medical examiner theorized that Misty's time of death was just eight hours after the initial search of the Upham family apartment. So if they brought the search dogs out, they would have found her in 30 minutes, or urged Charles Upham. Commander Herman countered that canines were employed to catch bad guys, not missing persons. Again, we have to wonder why it didn't seem important to search for someone who was allegedly suicidal and had found herself in mental health, mental health crises a handful of times in the past years. The police department said Misty did not meet their criteria for an elevated alert because she could care for herself. Despite having her involuntarily committed several times in the years prior to her disappearance, Herman has repeatedly told members of the media that he did not believe Misty was mentally ill. She was able to get into her car, go to L.A., and act as a perfectly functioning adult human being, he concluded. This behavior is unfortunately typical when it comes to police response to Indigenous women in crisis. Research director for Amnesty International pointed to another example in Alaska where troopers refused to send an officer to investigate a sexual assault, but eagerly sent three to respond to reports of moose poaching. The prevailing idea is that Native girls are all out partying and don't need to be investigated because they will probably eventually return home of their own accord. Co-founder of the Missing Sisters Crab Map, Lauren Chief Elk, warns that this system of policing is terrorizing communities of color. After six days of inactivity and lack of communication <clears throat> from police, Charles decided he would have to use community resources to find Misty. Robert Upham, Charles's cousin, agreed to lead a search party to find her. Members of the Muckleshoot tribe, along with other surrounding tribes, joined in the search. On October 16th, 11 days after she first disappeared, Robert Upham and friends Robert Kennedy and Jeff Bearhand set out to search for Misty. They looked at a map of areas and places they hadn't searched and places Misty could possibly be out of sight. There was a wooded area near Misty's sister's apartment where Jeff said bad things could happen. 
They set out to search that area, walking along a ridge near a ravine. Around 1 p.m., Robert Kennedy climbed down the ridge and found something purple in the leaves. It was a purse. He looked inside and found one of Misty's prescription bottles inside. Robert Kennedy told Jeff what he had found, and Jeff started to climb down the hill. He could see what he believed to be a gray shoe down below. He tied a rope to a tree and scaled down the cliff. At the bottom of the hill lay the decomposed body of Misty Upham. Ultimately, she was found just two blocks away from her apartment. Jeff stayed with Misty while Robert called for help. When the police arrived, they told Robert, Misty's uncle, to get off their crime scene. Though it was Misty's family and friends who found her, police interrogated them, treating them like they were responsible for her death. They didn't give them the time to grieve or process that they had just found Misty dead. Charles and Mona never did identify Misty's body. When they arrived, she had been zipped into a body bag, so they weren't able to see her. They did get to touch her arms and head through the bag, and they prayed with her. The King County Medical Examiner ruled her cause of death as blunt force trauma to the head and torso, injuries that would be consistent with a fall off a ravine. Whether her death was caused by foul play, accident, or suicide could not be determined, according to the medical examiner. She had a skull fracture and broken ribs. Examiners believed her time of death was around 9.30 p.m. on October 5th due to the state of decomp, which would have been about eight hours after her initial disappearance. The toxicology report revealed that her blood alcohol level was around 0.33%, which at that level, you'll likely have alcohol poisoning and experience loss of consciousness, which that's pretty important to greater details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Charles Upham told People Magazine that the family was devastated when they received the report and told the publication, quote, I have said from the beginning that I do not think she committed suicide. I think Misty either fell down or got hurt and couldn't get up because she was hiding from the police or she came to some harm by people she didn't know. I still have a lot of unanswered questions. In December of 2014, Commander Steve Stalker told People, at this point, We believe she did fall and that she died from the fall. At this point, we do not have any information to show foul play. We've had a missing person report on her, and we have been investigating this from the beginning. We have to go by the medical examiner's report, which said the manner of her death is undetermined. We just don't know. It's hard to take Stalker's statement seriously with the obvious falsehood smack in the middle. We know the department had not been investigating Misty's disappearance since the beginning. Also, declaring something undetermined is no kind of determination. It's incredibly difficult to accept a report of, we just don't know. It's hard to take stalker, oh, sorry. (laughs) Soon after Misty's disappearance, or after Misty's parents received the autopsy report, a family friend of the Uphams received an anonymous phone call from someone who claimed to know precisely what happened to Misty on that fateful October day. I know she was murdered, the caller alleged. The caller mentioned they were afraid to go to the police, but elaborated, quote, My cousin was at a house party up the street from where Misty stayed with her sister. Somehow Misty, after she left the apartment, tried to enter the house party and was drinking with these people. They got into an argument. Two of the men in that apartment beat her up and they killed her. When Charles Upham reached out to the medical examiner's office to inquire if there had been any evidence to suggest Misty had been beaten, they said no, there hadn't been. Right now, the case is closed. I don't have the authority to reopen it, but if I were directed to reopen it from law enforcement, I could, he had said. And um, I think this is really an interesting theory on this case because she disappeared at 1.30 in the afternoon, like we Mm -hmm. mentioned, and according to her family, she did not seem, she was agitated, but did not seem intoxicated. And to have her blood alcohol level at that level, it seems... Like a bit suspicious to me that she would have fallen off, off the hill when she did not seem drunk and then have that high blood alcohol level. I, yeah. Something's missing. Yeah, we were talking a bit about that, about how, um, you know, she could have become intoxicated at what point that could have happened because like she was obviously in a mental health crisis right. um, to the point she was acting very erratic. People were calling, you know, the police. It was like very... Right. Uh, a, a weird situation where I think if someone like that walked into a liquor store, would you sell them a gigantic bottle of vodka? <laughs> Probably not. And there wasn't something at home that she could have grabbed. So it's curious to think about where that could have come from, if not uh, from a party that she stopped in at or something like that. So that does seem like a plausible theory yeah, with that it's info. certainly worth looking into. Definitely. 
When Charles mentioned the anonymous call and expressed a desire to involve the FBI, the medical examiner agreed that was the best course of action. When he submitted this new information to Auburn Police Department via email, they acknowledged they had received the info and would pass it along. As far as we can tell, there have been no further developments into Misty's case. Despite being urged to take a closer look at Misty's mysterious death by the Uphams and actress Juliette Lewis, the police consider the case closed. I'm hoping it's just a story or a rumor, but if there is something that needs to be investigated, we want answers and we want justice for our daughter, Misty's father pleaded. I'm not going to stop until I find out if there's any truth to the story, and if there is, who did this to her. So that is the case of the mysterious death of Missy Upham. Before we close out the show, we'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. So if anyone has any questions or thoughts they'd like to share about the case we discussed today, about our podcast, or anything else you would like to chat about, um, just raise your hand and we'll try to get to everyone. Have some questions or anything about this entire weekend. Anything we you love to talk. Chat. Yeah, we're, we're open. And so, without any any questions, uh, I guess that's enough. Well, did, Murder. Does anybody for... have any questions or anything? Oh, you do. Oh. Nope. No, there was none of that. Yeah. None of that is noted in the autopsy report, no. They just said blunt force trauma, and then there was there was no further investigation a- apart from that. So, very yeah. curious. No attempt to find the victim or the doctor for about an eight hours. No. Yeah. That's part of the time to calm down. Yeah. Calm exactly. Down yeah. They didn't. They didn't try to find any uh, of the steps along the way that led her to that ravine. Yeah. So they didn't find out where she was at any other point in the day. There was no other reports on that. So, yeah, not at all. Mm. And that is a long time. And it's like even in a, a situation where she did fall over the hill. Let's say she was that intoxicated, and her parents didn't notice her slurring her words or any symptoms of that. If she Right. It doesn't sound yeah. like it. But like even if she was and fell down the hill, they were like right there at the hill where she fell for eight hours and somebody could have saved her. She would have been bleeding out. So yeah. it's it's like if they would have put any effort into this, they could have saved her if that's the case. Mm-hmm. But even they should have been looking for her no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't there a book full of some words she could have found or she bled out to where it showed blood and she could have been able to die? Uh, I don't know that I've seen. That was a very good question. I um, think you remember some mention of blood. Uh, I think that there was definitely no mention of like, it appears she was killed elsewhere or anything like that. So, I mean, it's something that maybe they just didn't care to mention or didn't care to look into. It was very just kind of open and shut. They were just like, well, well, she's dead. That's and it. I think That's it. <laughs> also, the house where the house party was was very close to her uh her aunt's house or sister's house where she was staying Mm -hmm. um so the house party was right there so it's still possible you know they she was bleeding out as she fell down the hill anyway so even if there was blood there it doesn't disprove she went to a house party right it does seem like she was probably sitting there for a while still alive like in that slope in the ravine um prior to dying so regardless yeah yes There's no mention of that, actually. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I think she was pretty unmedicated in I general. I think she was quite point. unmedicated yeah. at this point. She had really run out of all of her prescriptions, according to her dad. She was just using alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. So, Charles, you were talking about Angela. Oh. And so- <laughs> Mm-hmm. And they were only have a certain skin mm. to tell when they were dying or not dying. So wow. that part I don't think they got. Uh. It's really good to note that uh-huh. in this time, mm-hmm. if even within the same state, mm-hmm. if you knew or if you had talked to family or friends and found out that someone else had died for the same thing, they would wow. have been shocked and devastated. Wow. Wow, that is so, very upsetting. Yeah. So not knowing their health at the time. Yeah. Or yeah, it's nowhere near enough to cover. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that is so disappointing to hear. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts or questions you want to? Yes? What was the involvement of the FBI in the case? 
So um, there, there was pretty much none um, from what we can tell. And uh, all of the, it was just done through Auburn PD. And in previous cases, like when she was raped as a kid, that was a tribal police officer that she went to that told her to go home and sober up. Um, so like, I know that that was not good. Um, but as far as we're aware, there was no involvement from tribal police on this incident. Mm -hmm. um, her uncle is a, like he's, I believe he's a chief. He's quite yeah. high up in the community, but he's not PD. Right. So they didn't reach out necessarily to the FBI. Um, basically, he was uh, Charles Upham was told to uh, pass the information through the police department, and he did submit it in the way that he was advised. And they said, "Thanks, we're going to pass that along for you." And then he just didn't hear anything else. So I guess he wasn't really given the opportunity to reach out to them uh, personally. So uh, he's just kind of at a loss now. Like I don't know what happened from there, but we've had no other info. So. No. No one has come forward. Just the anonymous, yeah. or at least somewhat anonymous tip, but nobody else has come forward about it. Yeah. Yeah. I wish they would. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. I'll bet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who's covering for each other and who's like getting away with things? Right. Yeah. 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 I can only imagine it's really hard to embark on that kind of uh, advocacy without any information on where to start or who to talk to or just like no sort of info out there for you to call through. You know, I uh, don't offhand at this moment, but I think that is something that we uh, will look into and Absolutely. add to our episode notes for this episode when we post it on Friday. So. For sure. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Great. Okay, Great. fantastic. Thank you. Thank so you. Yeah. All right. Any other uh, questions, comments? All good. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. If you could actually use just a smidge more murder, you can get your fill on the OG, our website, murdermurder.news. You can also find us on all of our favorite social media platforms. We're on Instagram at Murder Murder News, on TikTok, also Murder Murder News, or on Twitter, it's M Murder News or M Murder News. Mm, murder. <laughs> and on Facebook, you can find us by searching for Murder Murder News. And while you're on Facebook searching for Murder Murder News, you'll also see our group pop up and you'll want to smash that join button if you want to talk murder with your favorite podcast hosts, hopefully, or your new favorite podcast hosts. Or if we're not your favorites. Or like, we can get whoever. some of your favorites on we'll there. We'll get some, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to stay in the loop about any upcoming events like this one, um, we've also done a number of virtual events. We partnered with Rebecca from Yellow Tape to bring you true crime trivia. We did a spooky drag show on Zoom during lockdown. And we've always got plenty cooking all October long from murder mysteries to Halloween parties. You'll also want to make sure you're a member of our Facebook group so you can take part in our Monster Book Club, which is a virtual book club. It's super great. Mm -hmm. uh, we've read so many great books together, alternating between true crime and spooky fiction, especially like this time of the year. We like to throw in a little horror reading sometimes. Yeah. And um, we do, I think we're out of those stickers, yeah, we're out actually. Of those stickers. Man, <laughs> so y'all, we went through all those stickers yesterday. So <laughs> we had a sticker one. to show you, but we'll, we'll get yes. some more made. <laughs> 
And uh, last month we read Don't Call It a Cult by Sarah Berman, all about Keith Ranieri on the women of the Nexium cult. And spoiler, it is a cult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this month we're reading The doc- or the Daughter of Dr. Uh, why can't I think how to say this? Moreau. Moreau. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, like all French, like just zapped <laughs> my mind. Um, by Sylvia Morena Garcia, who's a very talented author. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we met on Zoom last or the last Sunday of every month we meet to talk about our books. It's very low pressure, very low key. Um, you can wear your pajamas, you can bring a mimosa, you can bring <laughs> a pancake, whatever you like. We just kind of hang out and have fun. Um, so this month we're going to meet on October 30th and we hope to see some new faces there. And if you like what you hear today, uh, we'd love it if you could let us know with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And we consider you all to be honorary monsters in our cult just for showing up here today at the festival or tuning in uh, for anybody that's listening to this after. I know some people couldn't make it today, but if you want to make it official, you can also sign up to become a member of the commune on Patreon. And we want to note that uh, here, if you're here today in person, I know several of you signed up yesterday. We do have welcome packages, including those little baby goats you may have seen <laughs> we have just uh, around a couple left, so. for joining our Patreon. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, if you uh, if you make a pledge on the spot, we will uh, we'll hand it to you get personally. A baby, yes. So that would be you can enjoy it right away and not have to wait for it in the mail. Um, also, after this, um, definitely stop by our booth. We have our professional photographer with us today. Yeah. Uh, We're taking some cute cult theme photo photos. Booth. Yes, we have flower crowns you can wear, little goat horns. We can all just like <laughs> yes. show that you're in the cult and uh, yeah, have a cool little souvenir. Um, So that's it. Uh, Thanks so much to the Pacific Northwest True Crime Fest for having us. Thank you to our audience for being here, for showing (laughs) up. And thank you to our listeners at home for tuning into this week's episode. Uh, We hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks, everyone.